All right, good morning, Three Circle Church. We've got all of our campuses joining us right now and folks online. It's great to be with you. We're going to continue our Achilles Hill series in just a moment. First, I want to tell you about a thing that's coming up this fall. We do this in the summer, fall, and spring. It's called our Biblical and Theological Intensives. We just did the book of Exodus this summer. If you want to know what an intensive is, it's a way for you to go deeper, go further in your faith. And if you want to be a part of that, we're doing the five solas this fall. You might want to screenshot that. If you're interested, we're going to be talking about the pillars of our faith theologically, the things we believe as a church that kind of glue us together. It's going to be a deep dive. It's intensive because that's what it is, intense, all right? And we'd love for you to be a part of that. It's gonna start here pretty soon, six weeks. We're gonna hit it hard, dig, dig a lot into the truths that we believe. So I hope you'll be a part of that. Now, today we're gonna continue Achilles' heel. Remember, Achilles was this Greek warrior that was invincible except for one little spot where his mom dipped him in this water that the, the myth goes that made him invincible, but there was this one spot that didn't get touched by the invincible water. And that was his heel where she was holding him and dipped him in. And, and that little thing became a really big thing because in the greatest battle of his life against the city of Troy, this archer lets go of an arrow that hits that one spot. And suddenly a little thing became a big thing. And we're going to see that that's exactly what happens in our lives as well. A little thing can become a big thing. And sometimes we like to minimize and we like to say, well, you know, uh, it's not that big of a deal. It's not some huge problem. But then when the moment comes, that little thing becomes a big thing. And, and what we're doing during this series is looking at some of the little things that become big in our lives that the Bible says, this is probably true for all of us. We deal with these things. And so we've looked at the idea of our time and how we manage our time. Last week, we looked at the idea of identity, who we are in Christ. And today we're going to look at one more of those little things that absolutely can become big, big things. So when I think about little things that become big things, I think about when I was a kid in elementary school in the mid 80s. And those of you that are my age or older will remember this. Uh, we stopped school to watch this. The Challenger was going to take off. The space shuttle Challenger was going to take off. There was a teacher that was going to be on board. It was this massive buildup, right? And I remember the day we we're watching them all get on and we're all so excited. Everyone was so excited. And then there was that moment that I always couldn't wait as a kid to see the thing like light up. And there was that moment where it took off and it was so amazing to watch that shuttle take off. But then we all know what happened a few moments later. This happened, one of the greatest disasters in NASA history. And the whole world was shocked. And you go, how did all of this precision Allow that to happen. All these smart, the smartest people in the world doing all this stuff. How did that happen? You know, the, the space shuttle Challenger has over 1 million working parts, but an O-ring brought the Challenger down. An O-ring. Like, you got O-rings on the faucets at your house. And that's what brought it down. The O-rings could not operate correctly that morning because it happened to be the coldest morning on record for that day, that morning, where the shuttle took off in Florida and it actually dropped below freezing and they had never tested the O-rings in those types of temperatures and they could not expand and it allowed fuel to leak into places it shouldn't leak and it blew the Challenger up. A little thing became a really big thing and I just want to tell you, when you minimize little things in your lives, that can become huge issues as well. And that's what Peter warns us about. We've got that anchor verse where Peter, as an older man, was writing to all of us in the church and he could do this because he knew what it was like to get blindsided by the enemy. He knew what it was like to think he had it all together and then the enemy get him. And he denied he even knew Jesus three times, right? And so he writes to us to say, hey, you need to be on the lookout. Look what he said in 1 Peter. And we're going to read one more verse with it to, to see what he said here. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. He said, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now we go further. He says, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. A few things I see here. Number one, we need to know that we have a very real spiritual enemy who's looking for his opportunity, like a lion does, to attack. Also, we have some action items here. Verse nine says we should do something. Don't just let him in the house. Resist him. You've got power. Push back. And then lastly, it says here, we need to remember we're not alone. 
Sometimes as Christians, we need to remember, we're not alone. Everybody else is being attacked too. If you are a believer, you will get attacked. And we all do, and we all are. So we would say believers must be aware and proactive. Be aware, you have an enemy, be watchful, and then do something about it. Push back, resist him. Resist him and don't just waste your time, week one. Resist him and don't let anyone else tell you who you are but God himself. Let your identity, identity be found in Christ. So today we're going to look at another one of those areas that the scriptures teach us we all deal with. It's another one of our Achilles heels, and it's this. It's our minds. Today we're going to look at the mind. What's going on in your mind? And how this is an area where if we're not careful, careful we will be attacked. Now, before I dive into the mind, I always want to do this because one of my pet peeves in the church world it's how often we will oversimplify what are complex things and try to act like, hey, just do these three things, no problem. And so let me make clear as we dive into the mind, your mind is unbelievably complex. What I want to do is give you some tools today that I believe the Bible says no matter who we are, if we're Christians, these things should be happening in our lives. And this will be unbelievably helpful to help us win the battle of the mind. But the truth is, some of us are going to need some other things. And so if I break my leg, I promise you, I'm not just going to tough it out. I'm not going to be like, well, I'll be all right. Rub some dirt on it. No, I'm going to go get it fixed. And let me just say, here at Three Circle, we just pull all the shame out of, if you're dealing with stuff in your mind, by God's common grace, he's given us doctors and counselors and yes, medicine and things like that. And so we just want you to know today, no shame in that game. We want you to get the help you need. So today, what I'm not saying to you is, oh, just do these things and it's just, it'd be easy. No, I want you to know that we understand the complexity and we, we are here. That's, that's why we have a place like the Hope Center here at Three Circle to help people. But what I do believe is that all of us, no matter where we are, in our mental state, can do these things as Christians. And it will get us on the road to winning the battle of the mind. So, look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 4. And I want you to hear what Paul's going to say here about our minds. He's going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden with this thing. He's writing to a church that he loved, the church of Corinth. But he could have just as easily been talking to us. He says... I feel a divine jealousy for you. That means he loves them. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I love you so much. I don't want you to be attacked. I don't want you to lose your battles. I have jealousy for you. Watch this. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What he's saying, he's using wedding language to say to this church, I as a pastor want you to get to Jesus and, and, and love him and give your life to him and I want you to serve him. That's what he's saying. But look at verse three, but he's, a, he's, wor he's concerned. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent, that's Satan, as he deceived Eve, that's Garden of Eden, by his cunning, and what, what is he afraid Satan's gonna attack? Look, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. His concern for the Corinthians is they don't guard their minds. And every flash in the pan, cool preacher can come along. And if he writes a cool enough book and he's got a cool enough blog, the Corinthians are like, we like that guy. And they don't even run it through the filters of the truth. And Paul's like, guys, you're, you're going to make the mistake Adam and Eve made in the garden. He says, your mind is under attack. And my concern is you're going to be led off down a road that you don't need to go down. And can I just say today, same concern. I feel the same way Paul does. My concern is in a world where we have exponentially more inputs in our minds than they had, more stuff going on, more access to stuff than they had, my fear for us is that we would be led astray. And it's interesting that Paul lets us know that the first attack on humanity from our enemy was not on their bodies. It wasn't cancer. It was, you didn't see them start sneezing and hacking in the garden because all of a sudden Satan made them allergic to everything in the garden. He didn't attack him physically. His first attack was on the human mind. Did he really say? Is that really what he said? Deal with the motives. He went internal. 
That's where he attacked us first. And Paul said, that's what he's going to do to us as well. Write it down, church. The enemy will attack the mind of the believer. He will. And what we often do is we minimize it. And we go, well, at least I didn't act on it. At least it didn't do anything. I can't do much. I can't control what's going on in here, but I'll control it out there. And, and Jesus himself blew that argument out of the water with his famous Sermon on the Mount. So not only did Paul deal with this, Jesus did. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount went Old Testament, then brought something new when he clarified the Old Testament. So here's what he did. He said, and you probably remember this from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard it said. When he said that, he's talking about the Old Testament. You've heard it said, and his examples were, he said, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And everyone's going, "Uh uh-huh. He said, and you're probably thinking, right, that, that that means I can't do this thing. Remember what he did? He clarified. He said, but I say, if you think it, if you lust in your heart, in your mind, then. So what was he doing? What's he saying? Now, let me give you an example. So this past Friday, uh, we had to go take a tour of a college campus. I can't believe it. I've got a senior in high school. And we are touring campuses, and, and I cannot believe that he's there and, and, and at this stage of life. And what I really, and I'm not even going to mention the place, I'm just going to tell you the place we went to Friday, has got orange tigers. <laughs> and half this room is happy, and the other half's like, let it not be, let it not be. I see prayers going up right now, and it's like, oh, yeah. And if you're online right now, you probably feel the energy from the room at other campuses. And this is a dividing line in our culture, really. And so we're still praying through, you know, the travails that we're going through as a family. And it's, it's a shocker, okay? But anyway, here's the deal. What was Jesus saying when he said, I know you've heard it said, but I say. What he's saying is the Old Testament dealt with destinations. Jesus is going to backtrack that thing to the on-ramp. Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, don't lie. Here's another one, don't murder. Then he said, but we're talking destinations. I'm gonna backtrack you and tell you how to not even get on that road. Because murder is a destination. But he brought it all the way back to the mind. He said, but the on-ramp to the highway that ends with murder is hating your brother in your heart and mind. So Jesus said, the on-ramps that end up with very physical, behavioral, I can see it, destinations, the on-ramps are invisible. They're in your mind. Adultery didn't start there. It started here. You following Jesus here? So Paul does the same thing. Paul says, the first attack, what now? Out here. It was here. That's where the battle begins. And we can win the mind battle. I want to give you some tools today. So how do I win the battle of the mind? Let's dive in. The first thing we do is we set our minds. I want to give you some new language today. Set your mind. Did you know the Bible tells you to set your mind? Colossians 3, 1 through 2. It says this. If then you've been raised with Christ. So everybody hit the pause button. The question is, are you really a Christian? If you've been raised with Christ, that means are you a Christian? If you are a Christian, then this is how you should live now. It says, if you've been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above. That's something we need to start doing. Seeking, running after, leaning into, pursuing these things. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And here it is, verse 2. Set your minds. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind. Now that is a command from scripture. Now how does that work? Well look, in that same trip that we took the other day, there was an on-ramp. The on-ramp was in Bay Manette. You get on I-65. So if you wanna know how we got to that terrible place we ended up in. <laughs> well, you backtrack it and you can see that we got on right around Bay Manette on the I-65, okay? And that's what Jesus was warning us. You've got on-ramps and your on-ramp is your mind. That's where it is. But the Bible says what you do, though, if, is, is if you want to get to a different destination, you got to set your mind. And we do this, and I do it with my iPhone all the time. And that has saved my life because I'm very bad with directions. 
And I've, I've been lost a million. Before iPhones, I was lost all the time. Get lost all the time. My wife was worried about me all the time. We lived in Atlanta. Before we had kids, moved to Atlanta. It was right before all the GPS started happening. And I would get lost in Atlanta. And one of, the, one of these days, I got lost in Atlanta. And I ended up in a place in downtown-ish Atlanta. And I could tell you're like, okay, this, isn't, this doesn't look like a great place. And, but I was just dumb enough that there's a group of people on the side of the road and I just whipped up next to them. I start rolling my window down and like guys are backing up, the window's coming down. And then this guy looks over and I said, hey man, can, can I ask you something? I said, hey, I'm, I'm trying to get to, we lived in this area called Snellville, which is right outside of Atlanta. So I'm trying to get to Snellville. And this guy at this point isn't listening to me. He's looking around and I'll never forget. He looks all the way around and then he leans over and he's like, bro, you gotta get out of here. <laughs> Go to that light, take a right. Don't you ever come back down here again, man. Get out of here. So then the iPhone comes and it saved my life because here's the deal. There's that map app that's amazing and, and you just plug it in, but here's the deal. It won't, it'll take you places you don't need to go if you're not careful. You must put an address in. If you'll put the address in, it'll take you there. It's gonna pull you that direction and I love that, but here's the deal. You have to set it. I have to put in the address, and I have a home. It's one of mine where I can just hit home, and it's going to take me to my address in Fairhope, Alabama, and no matter where I am, it's going to bring me there. The Bible's saying that your mind is very powerful. God's given it to you as a gift. The enemy's going to try to attack it, so what you need to do is set your mind, and your mind needs to have the address of the truth of God, the person of God, the attributes of God, the gospel of God, the message of God. That's where we're headed, and you got to set your mind, and too often what we don't do is we don't set our minds. We just let our minds just float all over the place, and we put into our minds tons of trash and tons of stuff, and what we don't realize is we're ending up in the destinations that we're putting in there. You're ending up there. Your mind is taking you there. It's a map. Turn here, turn there. And we're just, we've never set our minds. So what the Bible's saying here is become intentional with how you set your mind. Let me ask you something right now. What address are you headed to right now? What on-ramp are you on? Be honest. If Jesus is right, and he always is, and if every road has a destination... If anger has murder as its final destination and lust has adultery as a final destination and on and on and on we go. If you stay on the mental road you're on right now, where are you headed? And is that a good place? And Is that where you want to be? And more importantly, is that where God wants you to be? We must set our minds. Secondly, we must guard our minds. Guard your mind. Peter said, in those verses we read earlier, resist him. Don't just stand there and let him come in the house. Do something. Stop him. Resist him. You've been given this power. And one of the things we can do is guard our minds. Your mind is a precious thing. Don't let just anything in there. Well, how do we go about that? How do we guard our mind? Well, look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, and, and the first thing seems impossible for us humans. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Really? I mean, I'd like to jump to the moon too. That seems cool, but it's, I'm not going to pull that off. And I think jumping to the moon is just about as much of a possibility as humans like you and I not being anxious about anything. Because we're anxious about everything. But you keep reading the Bible, and the Bible tells you how to do it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, and here's how you do it. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving and gratitude, let your request be made known to God. So what the Bible's saying here is the beginning point of guarding my mind is getting with Jesus through his word and prayer. I need to fellowship with God. And when I fellowship with God, verse seven says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. So what I love is God says, if you will stay with me, I will guard you. If you'll stay close to me. Now, if, you're not, if your prayer life looks like a thank you, amen, before a meal every now and then, and then if you get in a real pinch, maybe you'll talk to the man upstairs. If that's what prayer life looks like for you, then you're, you're on your own. 
then you're going to have to handle guarding your mind on your own, and you cannot do it. you got too many inputs. But if you spend time walking with God, if you'll become consistent with going to God in prayer and supplication, if you'll learn that rhythm in your life, God shows up too. God, you're unleashing a power you can't even imagine. And one of the byproducts of spending time with God is not just that you know him more and the joy that comes from that, and I can't even tell you how much joy comes from spending time with God. But one of the byproducts is he starts guarding your mind. In a world where you've got a million inputs, God begins to guard your mind. And, and let, me, let me tell you something. You'll want that. You want God to guard your mind. But it's going to take you spending time with God. And here's the thing. So many of us, so many of us just, if we're honest, we don't really spend time with him. And I'll tell you straight up, straight up, I wish that every person in this room would read their Bible every day and pray every day. I want that. But here's what often happens. We're going to give you some tools today because we'll never ask you to do something that we don't resource, tell you how to do it. But here's what often happens. It happens, I, I work out at a really cool old school barbell type gym. It's just my kind of place. And I'll go in there and I'll notice like there'll be people that'll come and they haven't worked out in five years, but they'll come in and they're going to they're gonna get it all back in that one workout. You know what I'm saying? So they haven't worked out in a long time. They're going to do a two hour workout. So they come in and they just blast everything they got. They blast it. And, and then the next morning, they can't move. They're in more pain. And you know what happens? It'll be another five years before they try that again. So they decided they saw a magazine. One day they're in the grocery store to see a magazine with a dude or a gal on there that just looks perfect on there. And, and they're ignoring the fact that they're using probably illegal stuff to get there possibly. Maybe I just, I got a hunch. And, and they, yeah, I'm going to look like that. And evidently, you're going to make it happen in one workout tomorrow. Okay? And, and here's the deal. And what you're trying to do is be a bodybuilder, and really what you need to do is just, just move a little bit. Let's start there. Because, come on now, you're probably not going to do that. Because there's other stuff, like eating dirt and lettuce for three months. You're not going to do that. But you know what you could do? You could start moving. You know what I mean? Walk a few miles every day. And then maybe come in and do... Do a nice workout that's going to get you, just get, get the ball rolling. But everybody wants to jump here, and the same thing happens in church. So what will happen is people, some of you today, you'll go, you know what? I'm with you, Chris, and I'll tell you what's about to happen. I'm about to read the Bible 20 times this year. I'm going to read the whole Old Testament next week. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, no, you won't. You will not. Are you going to feel real good popping through Genesis? Because it's interesting. It plays like a great movie. Exodus, probably going to get through that one too. Then you're going to hit Leviticus. <laughs> and that train is going to grind into the ground. I can hear the brakes tapping right now. And just like the guy who doesn't work out but once every few years because he hurts so bad afterwards, you're going to do the same thing. And you're going to sit that Bible down. And those of you that are going to pray, like, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pray an hour every day. No, you're not. You're not. So what will happen is you'll have an all or nothing approach. So I tell people all the time, you take this for what it is, but if you come to my office and talk to me, I try to get people to do this. I say, look, will you give God five minutes every day for a month straight? Because I'll take you giving five minutes a day to the Bible and prayer, five minutes, every day for 30 straight days over you telling me you're going to read the Old Testament next week. Because I know you might do one, you will not do the other. Okay, you're just not. But if you'll do the other, if you'll do the five minutes a day, here's what I tell people, and I'm just going to tell you how I started my life. Go to James. I want you to read uh, John. I want you to read the Gospel of John because it's my favorite and I got the microphone. You know what I'm saying? And so go read John. I just want you to start there, and I want you to read a chapter a day or a half a chapter, whatever you, you can, and then I want you to recite the Lord's Prayer. So you can read a chapter and recite the Lord's Prayer literally in like five to eight minutes, okay? And everybody's got that much time. I mean, let's be honest. You waste that much time looking in your fridge deciding what you're going to get out to eat, all right? And here's what will happen. If you read John, the Bible's alive, so it's going to start happening. Stuff's going to start happening. One day something's going to grab you and you're going to, you know, I'm going to keep reading a little more. And that five minutes will become 10 without you even thinking about it and then 15. So just supernatural things start to happen. But on the prayer side, I just tell people, start reciting the Lord's Prayer. Since Jesus told us to, he said, pray like this. So just start there every day. Just start there. And you know what's going to happen? I don't know when, but I've seen it happen. About week two, week three, you're reciting that every day. One day you're going to say, instead of going, Our Father, our Lord in heaven, hallowed be your name, the kingdom come, will be done. One day you're going to go, 
Our Father who... And you're going to stop. And you're going to say something like this. You're going to say, thank you for being my Father. You're my Father. And you gave your Son for that to be true. And the moment recitation moves from your lips to your heart, you will never be the same. Something's happened. And then the way Jesus meant that prayer to be, a guide rather than a recitation becomes your prayer life. And then one day you're going to get to your kingdom come, your will be done, and you're going to stop and go, Lord, help me live in a way today that looks a little bit like heaven on earth, as it is in heaven on earth. Help me. You see what happens? That's what happens if you will become consistent. And when that happens, God will guard your mind. Thirdly, to win the battle of the mind, we must discipline our minds. We must discipline our minds. This is a power-packed verse. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says this. And by the way, let me just set you up. Paul is going to compare the physical realm, which we all live in right now, to the spiritual realm. There's an invisible realm that's as real as the physical one. It's as much of a reality as this podium I'm, 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 I'm preaching from right here. It's real. There's a spiritual world. And Paul says this, though we walk in the flesh, you can look around and see all of this. He says, we're not waging war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Hear that visceral, powerful, explosive language. Take every thought captive. That's what Jesus meant when he said, hey, the on-ramp is in your mind. So instead of waiting until you end up at a destination that blows your life up, why don't you do battle here? Why don't you begin to fight the battle that God has given you spiritual weaponry to have victory in? We do not, here's the truth, we do not have to surrender our minds over to the enemy. You do have actual divine power. You do not have to go, well, I can't control what my mind does. Yes, you can. The Bible says right here, you've been given power, which is divine from God to tear down mental strongholds. That's what the scriptures say. But too many of us aren't doing that. Too many of us let our minds just float wherever they want to, and we do not use the power God's given us, so we end up inevitably in destinations we never wanted. And we think, how did we get here? And all I got to do is read the Bible and it says, well, you got on the on-ramp in Bay Manette and you ended up in Auburn. <laughs> I could have easily said, how did I end up in an orange city? There's orange stuff everywhere. Why are people saying something about an eagle everywhere I go? And they want me to pay for this? How did I get here? Well, Captain Obvious, four hours ago, you had a choice to make, but you went north on I-65. And here's where you are. See? And so the Bible says here, the Bible... Mm, Y'all pray for me. A lot of happy people and a lot of sad people right now. I get it. (laughs) Listen, the Bible says here we must destroy. Watch. Not just out there, but in here. It starts here. I got to argue with Chris Bell. I got to take the sword of the word to my own mind. Because when I start thinking unbiblically, when I start thinking in a direction, when I get on a path, I know it's not a good destination. Right there is time for me to take the word to my own mind and say, nope, 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 that's not what we believe. That's not where we're headed. You know that's not what the Bible says. You know that's not what God's word says. And stand on truth. And the Bible says, I have the power to destroy my own strongholds and bring my mind under submission to God. He's given me that power. How many of you are glad he's given you that power? Amen. And finally, we must renew our minds. We must renew our minds. And it is not a one-time thing. That's why you're going to see 
constant language here, ongoing language. It says in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. Well, that sounds really hard because this world's trying to conform us. How do I keep from it? Well, we must be transformed by the renewal of our behaviors. No, that's not what it says. That's too far down the road. That's final destination. It says here, be renewed in my mind. And how, I, how do I do it? It comes back to truth. Testing and discerning the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here, here's the deal. We're all saturating our minds in something. Your mind gets saturated. And it's a lot like this. When I, when I got married, my father-in-law taught me how to grill a steak. I did not know how to grill a steak. We, I didn't grow up in a steak family, okay? And so he's a good grill guy. And one thing he did is he had this marinade, and his thing was to marinate his steaks. But if you're more of a dry rub person, it works that way too. I, I, I do it all. And, and so, but it was, these steaks were so great. And so he would put it in a Ziploc bag and have all this stuff and let it soak. And, and you can do the same with dry rubs, but there always comes this moment. And I'm going to, first of all, tell you what it looks like. It looks like this. We all know this moment. It looks like that, but it sounds like this. Come on, everybody in the room, help me online. Let me hear you, Robert Stell, everybody. Tss. One more time. Tss. Best sound in the world, maybe. Like babies crying, your newborn baby cry, and a steak hitting a grill. There it is. There's the two right there, right? Okay. Now, what happens then when the fire hits that steak is that whatever you put on it and in it becomes evident, right? You smell it, the taste, the flavor. There it is, whatever went in. And listen to me. Every one of us, every day, you're living in the fire. Every day. It's coming. And when the stake of your mind hits the grill of this life and the sound comes out, what is it going to be? What's in you that's coming out? And what, what the apostles here are teaching us is that we must saturate our minds in the word of God. Winning the battle of the mind requires saturation in the word of God, because it is inevitable the fire's coming. That's what he said. Peter said, the enemy's coming, and all believers will deal with this all over the world. It doesn't matter if you're in Pakistan and you're a Christian, or China and you're a Christian, or Fairhope, Alabama, or Robertsdale, or Orange Beach. If you're a Christian, the fire is coming. And when it does, what have you been marinating in, saturating in? And my hope today is that we would employ these things so that we could win the battle of the mind to the glory of Jesus. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word today. And I just pray that you'd help us to have the victory you've promised us in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.